Hello and welcome. I'm Sonia Michaels. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the department chair of humanities and social sciences at DigiPen Institute of Technology. I have short blonde hair, I'm wearing a purple shirt, and I am in front of a background from the game Wildflowers created by Riley Hanlon of Studio Dry Dock. Uh, I'm Dr. Farah Nizamani. Uh, I'm a professor of English at the DigiPen Institute of Technology as well. Uh, my pronouns she, her, and hers. Uh, I have a short brownish hair, glasses, a green shirt, my Tanjiro earrings from Demon Slayer, and my background is mostly art, some of it from my students, and Bruce Lee in the background. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Hemovich. I am a, an associate professor of psychology at Japan and also one of the academic deans, and my pronouns are she, her, hers as well. And I am, uh, I would say I have medium length brown hair, black shirt, and my background is one of our classrooms here at DigiPen. So thank you for coming today. Okay, well, that was that was our little brief about us. And so um, this is one of our favorite uh, pictures of ourselves from PAX Dev in 2015. And I think we're gonna are we gonna re recreate this for right now? Sure. So that, all right, here we go. Um, <laughs> that uh, that was our see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil thing. But uh, but anyway, we're here to talk to you about uh, about games and community and all kinds of good stuff. So Vanessa, you take it away, please. Sure. And uh, feel free to wave if I'm going over the time, as always. <laughs> uh, so we know this is a very biased audience in a lot of ways that, you know, why are we here to talk about games? And one angle that we can approach this topic today is through the lens of kind of how we got into the idea, research speaking, um, that's kind of where I'm going to start in terms of what's called pro-social gaming. So COVID-19 is, is a terrible event and as a pandemic profoundly affected us. I'm going to talk a little bit today about one of the things that it did in terms of realigning some of the research, um, especially in the psychological realm, but also in game studies in general. So one thing that a lot of people intuitively feel, I think, is that the games industry and um, media, especially streaming media in general, saw this unprecedented boom um, through the, the early stages, especially of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have a, you know, a little asterisk here at the bottom of the slide. Sometimes I'll reference some of these sources here. So there's a lot of research happening and that's publishing right now, 2020, 2021, 2022, looking at the effects of what the pandemic did to a lot of gaming behaviors. And in general, we saw a, a lot of increases across many different genres for multiplayer gaming and streaming kind of across the board. The number of users on, on Steam, especially, also very easy to quantify and record is something that's been documented. And in general, the Global Games News Report uh, is, is telling us that we have billions of people who are playing video games. So it's a massive audience all around the world. And just with, you know, within the last decade or two, the internet use in general globally has grown, as you can see, uh, more than a thousand percent and almost all of US society is thought that if you don't have daily access to the internet, you could get it without too many barriers um, in that way. And a lot of games do run in an online platform. So there's a lot of, as I said, study trying to kind of understand how the tapestry of gaming has changed. And we're gonna look at a little bit of that today and sort of segue into some other areas. Uh, next slide, please. So with that having been said, gaming is one of those industries that saw a higher growth rate during COVID-19 and there were some other industries that also saw um, unprecedented growth as well. But we saw people spending more money playing games during the pandemic. And there was also a stronger lean into multiplayer gaming in general. So one thing that has happened on the research side is that people have become more interested in looking at, well, what are some of those benefits of gaming, especially during something like a pandemic? So the research is starting to emerge here and I'll get um, sort of specific in a, in a minute, but online gaming in particular, 
definitely seems to underscore and fulfill a lot of the social needs that we had, as well as maintaining community. So we're going to explore some of that today in this talk through a, a couple different examples, because in those situations where social contact isn't possible, I mean, if you put in the pandemic into that scenario, it's a pretty easy way to understand how games can fill that gap for us. But we also can think more broadly to diverse audiences, people who <clears throat> maybe live in rural areas, people who are not reaching out um, into the community in quote unquote traditional ways for a variety of reasons, games can really lend a lot of support there. So for the pandemic, what the research is starting to show is that there were a number of benefits to games, either it was reducing stress, alleviating, alleviating boredom, giving people a sense of routine and structure, and also reducing anxiety. So down there at the bottom of the slide, I have just some of the studies that are now emerging onto the scene. And if you look at the dates, you can see they're pretty recent. And as there's just this whole wave of research happening right now through sort of the, I won't say the, the post COVID era that we're in, whatever that new normal for us is going to be. Um, I just wanted to share that there is a ton of research coming out, looking at the pro-social effects of games within that context. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So there is a, fairly interesting study that has just been released and the citation down there is at the bottom. This is um, peers from 2002, Pierce et al. So what I have here are, uh, it doesn't always happen that this is the case, but this is one research study that actually shared some of their survey data. So a lot of times in research, you know, we deploy a survey. Do you like apples, oranges? How much do you drink water or coffee, et cetera? But this was one of those studies and it's very easy to find online. Here's a, here's a tip. If you uh, type in Pierce 2022 and add PDF to that, uh, add video games to the search title, you'll probably see the paper right at the top of the screen. So it's very easy to access. And these are just some of the data that they actually put into the study for us to read. And as you go through all of these, I won't read them point by point. This is just some of the feedback that players are giving to the scientific community of what um, Animal Crossing did, which was the game they were looking at, in terms of helping people to survive and navigate through the pandemic. So there is an entire avenue of research, as I think many of us are aware, saying that games are bad. And the pendulum is now starting to swing a little bit in a different direction. And in some ways, COVID is responsible for that. But the scientific community for a long time has been very displeased with the idea of focusing on the negative effects of games. And now we're starting to see just this absolute boom of research looking at the positive effects. Uh, next slide, please. So we've already known that a lot of games, especially multiplayer games, have a very rich and very well-established history with bringing people together. So again, my two colleagues have asked the, uh, the psychologist in the room to throw a little bit of science at us. And we have, again, lots of references. Um, these are just some more of the recent ones down there. Um, you can find these easily available uh, through the power of the Google. But we know that when people play video games, things tend to happen in terms of having an impact. It could be how people see themselves. We could talk all day long about social identity factors. Uh, I don't have time to do that today, but we do know that people who play games have a tendency to see a boost in things like information uh, processing, visual spatial capacity, memory, and there's a whole host of social dynamics and benefits and outcomes affiliated with games that is sort of this generalized umbrella term of pro-social gaming and the positive effects that games have for us. Uh, next slide. So when you hear this argument that, you know, games are bad and, and it's uh, a stain on the fabric of humanity if you are interested in games or if you help to develop games, I just want to give sort of the nickel tour of kind of where we're at in not only the gaming community, but certainly in the psychological and the scientific community as well, that we have, um, and if you see here on that first bullet point, it's um, Anderson. Anderson is sort of the, the pioneer name behind video games bad in that camp. And uh, there's a bit of controversy, and that's putting it lightly. A lot of the work by Anderson and colleagues argue that if you game, you're more likely to have externalizing behaviors, problematic behaviors, and things of that. Uh, there's a lot of sort of press right now around this notion of internet gaming disorder. And it's very divisive and it's a very hot topic, uh, especially in the world of games, but in the broader public discourse as well. And it didn't help that in the last year, the World Health Organization, they classified internet gaming disorder 
as a psychiatric diagnosis. So this immediately divided the psychological community right down the middle. And the World Health Organization has some controversy around its history. It tends to make big proclamations without really pulling in the rest of the scientific and um, sociological and scientific communities uh, because they it is such a massive sort of corner of those fields. So a lot of feedback came back that said, you know, this is a pretty controversial thing to do. You're aligning internet gaming disorder uh, with other types of gambling disorders, and it's uh, an unprecedented move. So that got a lot of the public interest uh, very skewed in, in many ways. And then adding to that, the APA, which is the American Psychological Association, they also have repeatedly come out with this uh, so-called task force that has uh, sent a message that says, you know, we have to be very careful with video games, video games are bad. And the problem with the APA, and these are my people as a psychologist myself, uh, this task force is routinely stacked with people who are very anti-game. So if you have a task force, the idea is that you should be somewhat objective to this uh, approach, and uh, that's not the case. So there has been uh, a number of uh, very, very loud critiques coming through. If you're going to say that games are bad, you have to come at this from a much more nuanced approach. Uh, next slide, please. So this conversation has made it all the way to the Supreme Court, which uh, fairly recently, and this has come up again and again and again, has not really been able to find a correlation that Anderson and other colleagues are looking for. So anytime you're in a discussion with somebody and they might say, you know, video games are bad and here's why, they probably heard about something that Anderson was putting out. So the counterpoint to that is Przybylewski, who's listed here. Uh, Przybylewski, published a paper after Anderson came out with a study called, um, and I forget the title of it at the time, but Przybylewski's response in his research was much ado about nothing. And then Anderson published a rebuttal and it was much ado about something and they just go back and forth a whole lot. And if you ever wanna learn about how that discussion is going, anything with Anderson and Przybylewski, Ferguson, these are the, the, the big names to, to be aware of. But this type of momentum is leading researchers um, across the scientific community, not just psychology, to say, you know, we really need to be careful because games can do so much for us and that games are good. And that is where that sort of pendulum has started to swing now, that we're starting to look at the social benefits of games and what happens when for ethical reasons, it's much like we see this in the drug study research that you have to run what's called a quasi-experimental design. So you have to work with the populations we have. We can't ethically take a group of non-users, 50 people into a control group, 50 people into an experimental group, and then have the experimental group use ecstasy and see if we can create an intervention to help them. So you have to do what's called a quasi-experimental design and work with the population we have. So one reason why we can't find a correlation really between and causality between video games uh, being violent and having some type of impact on problematic behavior is because we can't use a traditional scientific approach. We have to go with the quasi-experimental design. So that's why a lot of that research is um, sort of floundering, but we can take a group of non-users who've never played a video game have them play a whole bunch of different types of games and we can establish causality, that it brings people together, that we can see increases in memory, information processing, visuospatial orientation, contrast sensitivity. So games are good. And that's something that we have a lot of evidence to show. All right, next slide. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the time here. So we do know that people play games for a lot of different reasons. And as I mentioned, there's a whole field of research now that's getting a lot of backing that online gaming in particular can give us so many opportunities to connect with people. And that's what uh, Sonia and Fry are going to talk more about today. And the thing to remember is that gaming allows us to communicate and interact synchronously and asynchronously, which is great. And it can be also online and offline. So the reach of this is very, very broad. And a lot of the, and we all know this as gamers, I think a lot of games allow us to develop very rich and unique complex group identities, subcultures, emojis, all kinds of memes emerge and so on and so forth. All right, next slide, if you would. Thank you. So I'm gonna close out with uh, just some of the basic theory that we see in the games are good category that are starting to emerge. And one sort of way that they are kind of lumped together is through this understanding that we play games a lot of times. It doesn't have to be 
an online or multiplayer game in order to help us establish a sense of community. So the, these four general categories are how in particular online networks, including the internet, including social media, and also including games really do profoundly impact us. So when we play games, we become part of a community and it becomes important for us to cultivate those and maintain those over time. We also seek them out for group support and also games can allow us through communication to develop very specific social norms that maybe we wouldn't engage in in other areas outside of games. So it can be a lot of fun uh, as an arena to sort of play in. And then it also allows us to create group advocacy sometimes. Depending on the type of game we're playing and the type of format, we can really band together and see change, be a part of change. And it's very reinforcing, it turns out. Uh, next slide. So self-determination theory, if you haven't heard about it before, this is a big one in the pro-social games realm. The reason why we love Animal Crossing Among Us, whatever game of choice you happen to be particularly fond of, it's probably because it pulls from these three categories. Autonomy, you can go and do what you want. Relatedness, you get to be a part of that community. And competence, the game probably rewards you in some way when you do well. So all three of these together is sort of the perfect storm of why we love to play the games that we do and how they develop community. Uh, next slide. This is another theory. It's very big in this realm, social identity theory, why we merge into the communities that we play with, especially in online and multiplayer formats, because it does something to allow us to understand who we are through the lens of the games that we're playing and the characters that we become and the ones that we interact with. And there's a whole host of research behind all of these theories. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. Uh, do a quick Google search, social identity theory, video games, PDF, and you'll see probably an explosion of, of lots of good reading um, to learn more about. So with the eye on the clock in mind, I think I will transition over to my colleague, correct? That would be me. Yeah, Sonia. Uh, all right. Um, OK, before we continue, because we're going to talk about this, uh, this tendon to friend reaction and a lot of the research is still very heavily reliant on binary categories, and part of this is because much of the research I've been reading in the past little while has been done on rats, and so it is, uh, you know, male rats, female rats, etc. And so when we refer to this research, uh, we are not trying to stick to the binary, simply noting that much, much of this research has been done, um, you know, not not on humans, so to speak. And also it's clear that people, people all along the gender spectrum enjoy these sort of tend and befriend style games, also enjoy more intense games. And so it's, uh, you know, I, I just wanna make sure that, you know, that the next slide, because you, again, uh, <laughs> trying to be inclusive here. So I think the recent surge in popularity of games like Animal Crossing, I mean, Animal Crossing had the best timing ever, of course, coming out on March 19th, 2020, but also it spoke to something in a lot of people. And uh, so I want to make it clear that this is not, we're certainly not here saying tend and befriend games are for girls and women because it's simply not true. So let me talk a little bit about this stress response because most of what we hear about in our lives is the fight or flight response, which is, uh, you know, basically how do humans react to, to stress, fight or flight. And it actually goes a lot deeper than that because it wasn't until a couple of decades ago that people started doing research on populations that weren't just male humans or rats, uh, so, so, so to speak. So then about 20 years ago, um, a group, group of researchers at UCLA hypothesized that um, there are other stress responses that are marked by tendon befriend. So when you are stressed, instead of fighting or fleeing, you take care of people, you form alliances, you become more social, you uh, you sort of build and nurture social networks. And uh, so part, partly this is because when you are stressed, your body releases oxytocin as you know, which is a pituitary hormone, and that helps you calm down. And so instead of wanting to fight or to flee, you calm down, 
you're alert, you think, who can I take care of? How can I take care of this community? And so on. And so this is something that is somewhat suppressed by androgens, including testosterone, and somewhat amplified by, by estrogens. And so that's why it has sort of been referred to as a more female uh, response to stress. Again, please keep my disclaimer in mind. Um, and I know that this style of game has been for a long time, you know, popular as children's games. I remember first playing Animal Crossing with my daughter on her GameCube when she was like seven, six or seven years old and loving it. And still it seemed that the prevailing mood was that games like Animal Crossing were for kids and, you know, often for little girls, even though it was so much more than that. And I think now more people who create games are really coming to understand the value of care and nurturing as part of gameplay and reflection and you know all of those sort of softer perhaps softer perhaps more introspective acts that can still be a wonderful part of a gaming experience and you know unfortunately these games are still often dismissed by the people who say that you're not a real gamer if you don't play Halo or, you know, what, or, or whatever. And it's this sort of video games are for boys thing. And um, there is a whole suite of games from the 1990s that became known as the pink games, you know, stuff like Barbie, Barbie's, Barbie's Dream House and Horse Adventures and all of that. And they were sort of, you know, shoved into the corner and dismissed as, you know, not a big deal, in spite of the fact that they made some serious money. You know, th those games were incredibly popular, but there was still, there was and is still this gatekeeping, which is that um, um, I'm sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that many of us, when we say, when we're, you know, wearing a t-shirt for a particular game, you know, you get quizzed over, you know, how much you know about this game and, uh, you know, what's what's your gear score and what, you know, this, that and the others. So I think the whole idea that these types of games are not real games and are not for real gamers has been reinforced. I mean, this is the original toxic copy pasta, you know, that dear all women, Pokemon is not a real game, Animal Crossing, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to give it uh, give it airtime, but uh, but this is the sort of thing that that you have to deal with when you play games that uh, don't fit somebody's definition of what a real game is supposed to be. But let's move past that and talk about uh, the experiences that we've had. And um, I know for a lot of us, and I think probably for a lot of people who are with us this evening as well, Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing was a lifesaver, and I mean that you know literally as 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 well as as figuratively. I think Animal Crossing helped a lot of us hold on to a shred of ourselves when everything else that made us you know who we who we are felt like it was sort of suddenly being being taken away. And um, I remember I'd been very excited about Animal Crossing because, like I said, played it played it with my uh, with my daughter when she was just little. She's twenty five years old now, and uh, I was waiting for this game. And then when it came out, it was that perfect timing. It was literally the week after everything started uh, closing down, and I remember, you know, my my Switch friend list grew from among my students, and then. Graduation came around at the end of April, and everyone was sad because they didn't get a graduation ceremony. And then one of my students messaged me on Facebook and said, would you be the faculty representative at our Animal Crossing graduation? And I said, of course I would. I'd be honored. And so these are a couple of pictures from, I, I attended, I think, three Animal Crossing graduation ceremonies, and um, these are the pictures from one of them and I got to give a little speech and basically 
sat in my living room crying and watching people graduate. And uh, it was it was just the sweetest thing ever. And I was so honored to be to be invited to be to be part of that. And um, we you know, we had birthdays my my friend our friend Kim had her birthday party in Animal Crossing and she decorated her entire island with like hundreds of these hyacinth lamps that uh you know just just gorgeous and we all had to dress up for the birthday party and there was cake and cupcakes and so on and my husband and I celebrated New Year's in Animal Crossing and it was just one of those things that sort of reminded me of the world when we couldn't really be out in the world. And I will say, I still, I think I'm the last person I know <laughs> who plays Animal Crossing still every day. I'm only playing for 10 minutes every day now instead of like three hours, but uh, but I still play every day because it uh, it helps ground me in a similar way, you know, that it did through the, uh, through, through all of 2020 and, and beyond. Uh, Farah, take it away for Story of Seasons. All right. So um, I will not say that I got started in video games with Animal Crossing because I got started a while ago with, uh, yay, a, it was a while. So um, I do like Animal Crossing, though, because it's, I'm going to use the phrase low stakes, although that's not, not the best phrasing, but um, you can come and go as you please. Um, there's not a lot of heavy interaction unless you absolutely want it. Um, the worst thing that can happen really, if you walk away from the game for a few months is that you wake up and your hair is all messed up and a couple of shakes will get it back in shape. And you might find a couple of bugs wandering through your house or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's pretty low stakes and non-stressful, which is exactly what you want if you're, I don't know, in the middle of a pandemic or something. Uh, and very similar to that is a, a series called Story of Seasons, which uh, I believe is based on uh, the Harvest Moon series, which was uh, a while ago. Uh, but the one I'm gonna talk about very briefly is called Pioneers of Olive Town. And uh, you start off as someone um, who's inherited the family farm which is pretty standard and you get there and you have to start clearing out the the area and then you meet the townspeople and uh it's pretty low stakes as well kind of like animal crossing uh but with uh, a little bit more to it than that uh next slide please so uh, in addition to growing crops and fishing and mining, which is also pretty standard, you get uh, quite a few animals that you have to take care of. And they start you off with a chicken and then you kind of, you graduate up to uh, mammals and lots of them. And the thing about uh, Story of Seasons is that you have to take care of them. Now, I haven't not taken care of my animals. So I don't know if anything untoward happens to the animals if you don't take care of them for a few days. Um, but if you don't take care of your crops uh, and water them, then they're not gonna grow properly. And that's about it. Uh, there's not really anything awful that happens. Uh, the worst that can happen is that, you know, you don't take care of them and you don't get money to sell them. And if you need money to buy things, then you're out of luck. Uh, but you know, there's lots to do there. And again, it's pretty low stakes. Uh, there is one added part to Story of Seasons that um, Animal Crossing does not have. Next slide, please. And that's some romance. Okay, so uh, Animal Crossing, to the best of my knowledge, does not have any romance in it, at least not that I've found. Uh, Story of Seasons does a really good job of allowing you to find a romantic partner if you want one. And I was also very pleasantly surprised when I first started playing this that it's not just the opposite gender. Uh, some of the previous ones, if you chose your character, uh, your main character, and you were you chose a female character, your marriage partners were automatically male. 
or if you were a, you chose a male character, your marriage partners were automatically female. But with Story of Seasons, at least Pioneers of Olive Town, uh, you do get the choice uh, if you want to make a partner of a same gendered character, <laughs> there's plenty of them there for you. Uh, you got to work for it a little bit. You know, you got to keep giving them gifts and, and so forth to get those hearts up there. But there are plenty of characters for you to choose from. Uh, so again, uh, it's pretty low stress, but it's a little bit of a step above uh, Animal Crossing as far as the complexity of the, the character uh, relationships. Okay, uh, I think we're back. What are we? Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Okay. Um, so uh, moving on from that, you want you want uh, romance, you want diversity, you want. I, I'm <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about wildflowers because. And Farah, thank you so much for recommending this game to me. I um, I have loved pretty much every minute, most of the minutes that I've spent. <laughs> playing it. So um, Wildflowers is like, it, it builds on all that stuff that we've been talking about. You get to farm and you get to raise livestock and there's romance. There's, you, know, you can romance everyone. There's non-binary characters. There's a gay wedding. Um, that's not too much of a spoiler because it's, I mean, in the in the in the in the trailer they they start talking about this and from the moment from the moment you see like the first cutscene of this game you're like this is something different oh my goodness look there's a rainbow flag flying outside the uh the 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 town hall and there's such a variety of characters and uh, again it's not too much of a spoiler to say that there is also witchcraft um uh, there's there there are like all these different sort of streams through which you can play the game there's the uh the farming tend and befriend stuff there's the community building there's the romance there's the witchcraft and uh it is actually a really like it there is a lot of content in this game and you know it touches on a lot of things that you know i mean it's not all superficially nice. There is there's stuff that goes on that gets a little bit dark sometimes in uh, in this game. And discussions of such things as body image come up. There's a character who uh, who often talks about her relationship uh, history that is you know not not the greatest and talks about stuff like her uh you know her body image one thing i love about fairhaven is that nobody tells me that bikinis aren't for me which i got in the city sometimes and then another thing that gets uh, brought up a lot of the time is mental health issues is in, in this case in terms of anxiety there is uh there's uh, more than one but specifically this one character who tends to be very anxious and um and you know confides in our in our protagonist character about the anxiety of a lot of different things in his life there are characters who talk about the sadness that they've experienced of you know lost love and so on also i gotta say there's characters of a whole you know whole age range there is there is no ageism in this game there's no you know there's uh this is a wonderful, diverse little game. Heartache is discussed. And then, like I said, you get you get a lovely wedding. Um, you get at least one lovely wedding, but I'm not going to say too much more than that. And so it's, uh, I have to say that this game, and, uh, and yeah, I saw that question that you will be able to ask questions at the end. Absolutely. I think that this game has, kind of filled a place in me that since I started to wind down on Animal Crossing has sort of been missing a, a little bit. And then it not only filled that space, but it kind of expanded it beyond that. And I, it reached the point where I couldn't sit down to play this game if any other family member was in the room because they would stop everything they were doing to watch and to listen and look, why why did you skip that bit of dialogue don't skip that bit of dialogue because it is really really compelling and so it's it's like 
Animal Crossing like multiplied by about a thousand times in terms of in terms of the amount of engagement, emotional and social engagement that I've been feeling from it. And I think Farah, you've been feeling pretty much the same way um, as, as far as we've discussed. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add a couple of points before we go on to the next game. Um, and that is that they do humans very well. Uh, when uh, we were when we showed you the slide um, about diversity, uh, it's not just um, racial and ethnic diversity. There's um, there's the age diversity as well. You know, there's a few children running around, and they're not just your stereotypical happy little children. You know, there's they grapple with problems as well, and this. Uh, video game starts off uh, much like Story of Seasons did, um, where you inherit or you are about to inherit uh, the family farm. But in this case, um, I'm, I'm going to try not to spoil anything for you, but you come to uh, Fairhaven in order to help out your elderly grandmother. And they do a very good job of showing her as elderly. Um, there's plenty of points where she needs to sit down because she's tired and uh, you'll see if you're watching closely you'll see that she's um, maybe a little palsied her hands are shaking a little bit and uh, her voice sounds very much like an elderly woman um, as does the character a couple of slides back his name is Shelby uh, they don't sound like young people or middle-aged people they sound quite old, just like they are. And all of these characters, uh, you shouldn't skip the dialogue if you play this because you will learn so much about them. Definitely. And uh, the voice acting is fantastic too. Oh my goodness, it is fabulous. And um, it grapples with a lot of sometimes very, very difficult ideas, uh, not just what are the prices of my turnips today? Or, gee, am I going to be able to harvest those crops before the turn of the season? Um, you know, there's a little bit of that, uh, not the turnips, but the harvesting of the crops. Uh, but there's also a lot of interpersonal stuff that goes on there that uh, I am very happy to see in a tend and befriend type game. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agreed that it's, um, I, th I think this this really raises the bar for this mm -hmm. sort of game as far as, as far as I'm concerned. And al also because not, none of the characters is like uniformly anything. Everyone has their light and their dark and their, you know, their good side and their darker side and, uh, and so on. This game made me cry way yes. more than once like many times this game made me cry so, seriously um, yes. that is my bar for something that uh you know the the, the bittersweet it, it hits the bittersweet button quite beautifully mm -hmm. so, oh yeah, yeah and, and, and one more thing okay. the artwork in wildflowers is divine uh if you do nothing else you'll just go and love it for the artwork yeah. and it's my background uh, oh. it's my it's my zoom background so um yeah yeah Mm -hmm. All right, so now this next one um, is called Cozy Grove, and again, with the artwork, if you love excellent artwork, uh, this is one of the games for you. Uh, this is a game where you are what's called a spirit scout, and you arrive on a haunted island. You, you've got some spirits there, mostly bears or some form of bear, because some of them, they are looking kind of hybrid over there. Uh, and these bears are stuck on this island because they have some things that they need to let go of. And your job as the spirit scout is to help them deal with that so that they can ascend. Okay, so, uh, next slide. So, uh, I had to pick and choose which characters I wanted to talk about because, and there are quite a few of them, uh, and they all have different issues. Um, they look cute and everything, and they are pretty cute, but this is again one of those games where you don't really want to skip over the dialogue because you learn a lot about these spirit bears. So this one is Jeremy Gruffle, and he is the maker bear. So when uh, you need something crafted or your tools break, he's the one that you go to. Uh, but the thing is, is that he's actually not that good at making stuff. Uh, he loves to make it, but everything breaks or it doesn't 
it's not exactly like what he wants. And the thing about Jeremy and, and about with all of these bears is that you learn a lot from them uh, just from their interactions and you learn life lessons from them, which you're not necessarily going to get in Animal Crossing or Story of Seasons. Uh, and so with Jeremy, he just reminded me that, you know, you don't have to be good at everything. If you like doing something, just do it because you like it. Uh, there's no reason that you have to be super duper qu good quality at everything. Just get in there and do it just because you like it. Uh, next slide. Okay, this was one of my favorite characters. This was Ursula Pine. And Ursula uh, is our gardening, nurturing mother type, uh, as you can probably guess from that scene. I just love that big sunflower around her face. Um, and uh, she's had a pretty difficult life, but uh, she's tried to face it pretty well. And she had a couple of lessons that she had to learn as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, I'm sorry if there are any spoilers there, but uh, this is an example of some of the very excellent dialogue and storytelling that you have here in this game. Uh, so when Harold left, um, that was her husband, she was left with uh, seven cubs. Uh, and, you know, as a mom, she's a little bit overwhelmed, you know, and, um, but then when one of her cubs left, uh, it kind of gave her a wake up call and she said, I needed to change. I needed to find the sunlight between the shadows. And there again, that is a lovely life lesson. Things can be dark and down sometimes, but, you know, you, if you look hard enough, you can always find some sunshine there. And I think I must say that out of all of the bears that I have ascended, um, or rather my spirit scout has ascended, uh, this one was probably the most difficult. Um, I actually had to wait a couple of days before I went and talked to her because as you progress through the game, you, you get these signals that, hey, this bear is about to ascend. And with some of them, once they ascend, their area is taken over by another bear and you don't see them again. And so with this one, I was so vested in this bear that I had to actually wait a couple of days and go, you know, I'm not going to talk to you for a few days because this is going to be the last time that I talk to you. Uh, and, you know, when a game gets you like that, that's pretty good game right there. Okay. Uh, Next slide. I just started playing this and you're already, you're already making me weep. <laughs> It'll be good, okay? <laughs> It'll be fun. Okay. Um, Patrice Furback. <laughs> now this game is not all dark and depressing and okay, there's life lessons all over the place, but they're very gentle. Uh, Furback is the postal bear and he, I love him. Uh, He's, he comes across, it says, some troublesome packages, screaming in Aramaic or spewing demon fire. Those are actually the least that he has to worry about. There's some more that are pretty bad. Um, but he had a, a pretty interesting backstory. Um, and I, I won't let you, I, I'm not going to spoil this one for you at least. Uh, but he is a lot of fun and he is oftentimes a, a breath of sunny, fresh air and what can sometimes be a little bit sad. Okay, next please. All right, Allison Fisher, she's the baker bear. So anytime you need something baked, uh, you go to her. And here in this picture, uh, in the screenshot rather, what you're doing is giving her a hug because all of your bears need hugs and they love hugs. At least most of them do. There's one or two that are kind of standoffish, but eventually I break them down and they all accept my hugs. And so that is one of the things that I really appreciate about this game. It takes into account the um, human touch, if you will. I mean, like they're bears, but okay. Uh, the, the understanding that humans need to hug each other. And when they're sad or upset or when they need a little comfort, sometimes a hug goes a really long way. 
Now, the thing about Allison Fisher is that she's a, a baker and she has her own bakery that you can see in the background there. But sadly, next slide, please. Allison loves to experiment a little bit too much. So uh, one thing she did that, and she's got a whole array of recipes that are like this, red pickle flan. And you go, ooh, red pickle flan. Yeah, she's out there experimenting with everything. Um, and then towards the end though, uh, when she realizes that she's not that great of a baker and that people kind of don't like her cooking, they just humor her. She says, you know what? I could see this as a curse, I, but I'm gonna choose to see this as something good. And I'm gonna keep trying. And again, I'm gonna do that just because I like it. And I appreciate my friends who still come to eat my food, even though they don't like it, because that makes me happy. And if they're willing to do that to make me happy, then I'm gonna do that to make them happy. Okay. okay, just a couple of more and then we'll be off. Uh, the next one, please. Octavia Cubbins. Okay, so Octavia is uh, wheelchair bound, as you can see. Uh, but she, she is, whoa, not letting anything stop her. Uh, she was very difficult to help at first because she didn't want any help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, she says, I don't want people making assumptions about what I can or can't do. Had enough of that in life, and I don't need it in my afterlife, too. So that's Octavia. Uh, she is a surfer bear, and so every once in a while, she'll tell you about her adventures surfing and swimming down in the ocean. Um, she is a lovely bear. Uh, next one. Okay, so back in the not all gloom and doom category, we have Bruin Tran, who I think the best uh, descriptor for him would be um, conspiracy theory bear. Uh, he has some interesting, very interesting ideas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, secretive government alliance with the reptilians. Uh, yeah, weird folklore folkloric energies just got to be tuned into the right frequency this character literally gives you a tinfoil hat to wear around uh, if I had a picture of it I would have put it in there but this is Bruin Tram and uh, he's trying to shed himself of these conspiracy theories that he's been fed um, so stay tuned uh, I know how this ends uh, Sonia, I don't want to ruin it for you or for anybody else who's listening. Uh, okay, I think we've got one more to go. There we go. Yeah, and there we go. Dahlia of Cosgrove. Okay. Uh, Dahlia, she is a mix of funny and, okay, I'm going to use my PG-13 rating here. She's a badass and I love her because she was literally a revolutionary. The first time I saw her, Sonia, plug your ears if you don't want to hear this, her first quest for me was to give me some pamphlets to hand out to the imps so that we could foment a rebellion among the imps. So uh, that's her and you can see her little target right there and there's a little bear reading in the back and uh, there's her trebuchet somewhere. Uh, next slide, please. And this will probably be the last one of mine. Uh, she says, I'm Dahlia of Cosgrove, first among my people to raise a hand against the empire. By tooth and claw, I fought to end the tyranny and its greed. But the thing is, yeah, she had the best of intentions and the noblest of hearts, but sometimes things don't work out the way you planned. And sometimes you have to look at, I think Vanessa will appreciate this, impact over intention. Uh, so she had the best of intentions, but the impact may have been a little bit different than what she thought. Um, so yeah, so that's Dahlia of Cosgrove. And as I said, there are plenty of other characters with plenty of different stories. But I gotta say that as an English professor, I love the storytelling here. I love the character development, the complexities of both the storytelling and the character development are just top notch. 
There's no standard stereotypical much of anything in this video game. And that combined with the artwork makes it top notch. And if you have a chance to play it, I highly recommend it. Okay, and I think that will do it for me. Okay, so let us just segue into a brief note on the stuff that we are playing these days. Farah, what are you playing right now? Uh, wildflowers, uh, Cozy Grove, Story of Seasons. Gee, <laughs> there's a thought because we've talked about all three of those. And there's another one called Witchwood that I really liked. It's not a tend and befriend. It's just a bunch of uh, standard quest. But if you like artwork and you like awesome storytelling, again, uh, which one is going to be for you? I'm still playing Wildflowers. I find that I'm playing it a little bit less now that I've completed sort of the main, the main storyline. Animal Crossing. Hey, it's mushroom season in Animal Crossing. Uh, so I woke up and went and found my mushrooms and... Uh, and so on and i've just started cozy grove and now i feel like i'm gonna have to just like take a little break because i'm gonna get all verklempt uh, while i'm playing cozy grove apparently <laughs> and i i'm trying to play stray but i can't handle first person for very long i get very woozy and dizzy and motion sickness so i can only play little bits and pieces of uh of stray vanessa you're the outlier what are you playing <laughs> This is how I know we're going to quiz our chat here and see if people are really paying attention. I am a huge PUBG action adventure RPG gamer. Tend and befriend games are not my area. So let me be yeah, the outlier example. I love playing Mortal Kombat. Uh, I'm, I've played through The Last of Us uh, 1 and 2 and uh, both Plague Tale games. Highly, highly recommend. And, you know, it's just to show that games can be very diverse in terms of how we are connected to community and I'm a very competitive gamer I I am not always playing games that have violent content in them uh, my own research has shown uh, I just put out a paper last year uh, that it's not so much the violent game content that can get people turning towards each other it's you know when we start losing in games it's the competitive factor it's uh, you know poor level design it's when things are not fair the win loss ratio so uh, both as a professor and as a player i can appreciate the nuances of how i mean just look at the slide there's just so many different games here that you know amongst the three of us that we're playing and um, so yes I, I i try to dip my toe into a lot of different different areas <laughs> And here's what is on the to be played list, which is right next to my to be read list of about 10,000 books. Oh. Laura, what's next? Well, uh, my kids recommend, and when I say kids, I mean my kids' kids. Uh, my kids recommended Baron Breakfast, uh, which from what I can tell is exactly what you would think. Uh, a bear runs a bed and breakfast and you continue from there. Uh, Spirit Fairer, which I'm going to be a little bit hesitant to start that because it, I, I think it's another one of those where you help spirits pass on. But if it's uh, anything like what I can tell from the trailer, it's going to be a little bit sad. And I'm not sure I want that right now at this moment. Uh, and there's an another one that I saw called The Awakening of Mummies, which is not a tend and befriend at all. It's more of a puzzle game. Uh, where you encounter a bunch of mummies that you need to reawaken and help them not die again. Okay, well, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to in spring 23, Fae Farm is coming out. And again, I think it's going to be a nice mix of Animal Crossing-esque, um, you know, village, village and farming life, and then plus a little bit of magical content. And uh, the the studio director is somebody I know, and she's excited about it, and I'm excited about it, and so on. And one of my students the other day recommended The Wandering Village, and just looking looking at the questions in chat, you know, the, one of the questions, have you noticed more of the male identifying students playing more tend and befriend games post-pandemic? It was one of my male students who recommended The Wandering Village, said he's really excited about it, and you are, it's a village life game, but the village is on the back of a giant creature. 
that hey. walks through the world. And I looked at the trailer and it looks so beautiful. And I'm wondering if I should try Coral Island, but I haven't heard so much about it yet. And I'm sort of on the fence about Dreamlight Valley because I'm not the I'm not a huge Disney person, but it does look really beautiful. So I'm wondering if it's worth uh, grabbing grabbing Dreamlight Valley. I was just looking at that yesterday and uh, and thinking about it. And Vanessa, what you're playing next is basically anything that doesn't have flowers and a cottage core <laughs> aesthetic, correct? All right, chat, you should know. It was very difficult for me to come to terms with this slide deck aesthetic. <laughs> There were lots more flowers and butterflies before I came through and I relocated them to a, a different realm. Uh, and I had to fess up about it because it did feel a little bit bad, but uh, I, I really, you know, I can get very persuaded by uh, like Ori. Ori is a beautiful game and uh, I haven't played through the second and I'm looking forward to playing through that. Uh, but, you know, as I said, there's a certain genre that I tend to go for, a space game in particular, uh, Callisto Protocol, maybe a little bit too much into that extreme, but I really, I, I played the latest Resident Evil. I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. That's just my jam. I, flowers, sunshine. Uh, not to say I cannot be moved by such things. I just tend to be um, in, in the sort of other camp. But if you have any recommendations for any of us, definitely let us know in the chat. We're always taking recommendations from our students and, you know, a, a game like Stray or Ori, that's the aesthetic that I tend to get sort of suckered into very easily and can, um, you know, I can get very biased by. Also, when our students make games, we play them. I mean, Robo Recall mm -hmm. is a great example. I think it's one of the best VR games ever made, and it's a little older now, but we had three of our alumni uh, as a team of, I think, 10 people total, 11 people who made that game. So you can try to argue with me what's the best VR game ever, and it's it's got to be Robo Recall. Um, and I'm sticking, sticking to my yeah. hands on that one. Let me just interject here that if I could play games like Counter-Strike and Valorant and Halo, I would, but my hands just can't do that when it seems like you've got to have 15 fingers for one move. Um, I just, I haven't mastered that skill yet. I have tried. Um, I keep getting stuck in corners and falling off maps and yeah, it's not pretty, but if I ever master that, I will probably be right there with Vanessa playing those uh, shooter games. We definitely are less skilled than the majority of our students, I think. But um, looking at that question quickly in the chat, it has the games we play and, and know about and the community in general have a massive impact on our teaching. And it's one of the joys of being both a gamer and a professor that you get to see some of the behind the scenes on that and can definitely mm -hmm. chime in in a, in a class. But I use different, at the start of every single semester, I ask my students, what are your favorite and least favorite games? So we put you know one on one side of the whiteboard on one side of the room and then the other on the other. And then I use those examples frequently. So when we go to do class activities, which is almost daily in my classes in psych, we draw from those examples um, in class and it's just, it's important to stay informed. So we have to just keep playing lots of games. Absolutely. And um, I, I want to come back to that question, but I just wanted to, before we end up on our final slide, I just wanted to share this uh, this quote from a game developer, Brie Code, and, uh, and she writes about these kinds of games and says, these are games that will carry us into a more respectful, more respected and strengthened future. This is where video games can shine, not just as bright, but brighter than other media. And, uh, and I love I love that whole that whole thing, and uh, and I would say, re yeah, returning to that, definitely, the more games I play, the the better I teach. You know, it's uh, it like you know, like anything, we have to be able to connect with our students and uh, and understand where they're coming from. And so, I'm that person on you know various. Facebook groups full of like people my age defending games and defending Gen Z and defending gamers and I'm and, and I know that that you are too far and uh, so yeah how do you find it affects your teaching? Uh, I find myself uh, pointing out a lot of the storylines and a lot of the dialogue uh, of the video games 
Um, and since I teach mythology, I also, uh, in epic literature, I find myself referencing, okay, you know, in this video game, when they do this, yeah, that's straight from mythology. This is nothing new. Uh, and that perks them up a little bit because sometimes they don't think of things. I mean, if it's something like, I don't know, like gods of war or something, uh, you know, that, that has a really strong overtone of, um, of mythology they can figure that out pretty well but other things uh, I've noticed that they when I point out to them how important the storyline is and how important the character development is uh, they do perk right up and do pay attention so yay for that and I remember a few years ago there was a team that did a game that was very mythology focused and I believe you mm -hmm. consulted with them about that one yep yeah, they once you get them with the, the mythology hook and you can start talking, to, they just love that for the most part. And I think that that can only help improve the games, um, because as we just I mean, we just went through the whole list of, uh, well, four, but Animal Crossing up through uh, Cozy Grove and Wildflowers and the the writing is so different and the gameplay is so very different. And. I think that there is so much room for different types of creativity and different types of games. Uh, I firmly believe that the gaming industry is only going to continue to expand and the more diverse you can, they can make the games, the better it will be. And not just like different game titles, but different types of uh, games, whether it's just something low stakes like Animal Crossing or whether it's something uh, much more involved. Uh, or whether it's something really that needs to be grappled with, like uh, The Last of Us. Um, that's, it can only improve from here, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also, I, I wanted to mention that one of our professors who teaches narrative design is, uh, is using the game Unpacking in her class this semester. And that is a beautiful little game. And the narrative is, I mean, it's award-winning narrative, but it sort of sneaks up on you. And so there's, uh, you know, again, we're trying to, I think most of us are trying to update our materials, update what we're teaching in response to what's going on in the industry. And, you know, and things change quickly sometimes. So, yeah. Oh, and we, I see we have another question in chat. Um, yeah, we you aren't in chat, right? Do, do you see it? I oh, do have my Twitch up, but I just can't reply. Okay. Have we seen an uptick in student making more tend to befriend games since the pandemic or just in general? I think it's hard to know sometimes what, you know, what, because, you know, our students in September just started their new projects, some of them. So we don't know what some of them are yet. I'm always excited when spring comes around and then we get to see some finished, uh, finished projects. I can say that students are talking about these types of games now very differently than three, five years ago when, you know, oh, you're playing one of those kind of games. I mean, now the value of this genre has really just started to shine forth a bit more. And mm -hmm. um, our students in general at DigiPen are a very inclusive community and not everybody gets along, of course, it's a large group of people, but the idea of building a sense of community and support has always been a pretty strong fabric uh, from, you know, the freshmen through senior cohorts. And the idea that, you know, you're into this type of game, it's like, oh, cool, that's, that's neat. And I've seen that change with attend and befriend type of uh, perception in, in the last several years, especially in the last, I would say, two years or so. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, there was another question, Sonia. How does it feel for us to be the fan favorite professors of DigiPen? <laughs> I can say this is Dr. Vanessa Hemovich, uh, academic dean, associate dean of faculty development. I get to see all of the teaching evaluations and the humanities department that has psych, English. What else do we teach? Uh, Calm. Uh, a variety of courses were repeatedly the, the one of the highest ranked. I think we are the highest ranked department across others um, because we do connect with our students. And as you can tell, talking about this kind of thing, it's very easy to do and we take great joy doing it's it. It's fun and it's exciting. And yeah, yeah, the question that came back around is, have you noticed more of the male identifying students at your institution playing more attend and befriend games post pandemic? Um, my switch friend list is full of, of all kinds of students um so yeah I think 
I think I have. And uh, we had an alumni event uh, a couple of weeks ago and some 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 of the guys came up to me and were like hey are you still playing animal crossing and uh you know we we traded dinosaur bits around and so on so uh <laughs> to bits of dinosaur skeletons so so yeah i think that i think that it's definitely like vanessa said in the past few years especially i think it's things have changed a lot there's been a real sea change in the way our student body has has presented themselves and the kinds of things that they're interested in, I think has broadened a lot as well. I agree. Do we have more questions? If you got questions, we might have answers. Happy Maybe. to try. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a lot of fun to be here. And we are here because we really want to be here and to talk to the community kind of at large and get outside the DigiPen bubble a little bit. And it's fun to hear mirrored from our students what we're seeing, you know, just in an audience like this one of, mm -hmm. you know, the value of connection and uh, lots of related sort of things around that. Yeah. Can and I have to say Geek Girl Con is one of my favorite events ever of mm -hmm. any year, <laughs> any time. <laughs> and so the fact that it's back this year makes me really happy mm -hmm. and, um, I'm hoping to maybe see, you know, find some art at the, at the actual in-person thing that, that sort of resonates with some of the games that we've been, we've been talking about. And come find us at PAX. Uh, I think that many people are local. I don't know that for a fact, um, but, you know, we tend to, if we're not giving a talk at PAX Dev or something like that, we're usually around. So please don't hesitate to reach out, connect up. We like um, helping students connect with people, uh, whether that's an industry specialist or you have questions about internships and jobs, all that kind of thing. Uh, we work mm -hmm. a lot in that department, in that capacity, not just for our students, but for the community at large. So we do. Oh, we have another question. What do our colleagues think of the growing interest and trend in these types of games? Hmm. Well, I know Angie, the narrative person I mentioned uh, is very much, very much into this. What do you know? <laughs> I'm trying to think like across different departments at DigiPen, but also broader in the community. And it's very telling when we do a talk like this and it gets received by a large organization like this one, uh, this conference. And it's very well received uh, across similar types of context, whether it's publishing an academic or research paper or a book chapter, I'm seeing more calls for that type of research and, and a broader understanding of, like I said at the beginning, pro-social gaming. And for so long, it has been games are bad. Here's why. We can't prove it, but it sounds intuitively like it would make sense. And let's you know examine that with a, a scalpel and look at how terrible your research methodology is um, for claims like that and then the other side of that coin is games are good it can help with you know how you process information and it can bring us together as a community well what type of research have we got it's the covid played a role in that but now we're seeing a huge uptick from the scientific community even outside of psychology for just talking about uh, more even medically based research studies. What is the power of community for healing, growth, connection, empathy, things like that? And these games are getting talked about more often and used in research more often in those spaces. So it's a lot of fun to see. Yeah, and uh, I, I I would say that you know a lot of our colleagues are definitely on board with this. I can't speak for everyone, but uh, but the one the ones I hang out with tend to be. Hmm. Well, we hang out with pretty cool people. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> Present company in the chat included, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, if, if if any of you sees us around at the, on, on Saturday, please come over and say hello, because uh, I'm I'm going to be there. Be wearing my mask, but I'll be there. So, do we have any more questions, or should we wrap? Oh, well, my chat just froze. So I'm no okay. indicator. <laughs> Okay, well then, if we uh, we're we're running a little bit, uh, we're a little bit past eight anyway. So uh, I think that we will we will call it at this point. And uh, if anyone would like to get in touch with us, talk more about this stuff, we're always excited to uh, to be contacted by uh, by people. And uh, and 
thank you so much for coming and uh, and have a wonderful wonderful con if you uh, if you're coming to the uh, to the real live one on uh, on the weekend so thank you so much and uh, bye bye.